afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the second keynote speaker, Dr. Catherine McKittrick. I first heard Dr. McKittrick speak exactly 15 years ago, September 2004, in a classroom as my Women's 330 International Woman, it's no longer called that, don't worry, <laughs> professor at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. This was just a few years before she became THE Catherine McKittrick, before the publication of her brilliant and highly influential seminal work, Demonic Grounds, before her name became synonymous with the field of black geographies. But even then, in the classroom, most of us already knew that she was extraordinary, that she would make waves. She blew me away any time she spoke. I would just sit there and wonder, inspired. And I was also excited that she was the first black teacher I ever had in a Canadian classroom. Her presence was palpable to some of us on Queen's campus. My friends and I would chat about the new professor, the one who was unapologetically black, the one who was unafraid to take up space. Back then, we never saw Dr. McKittrick with her hair up. It was always out. <laughs> don't know what happened. We, <laughs> we too slowly followed. Unbeknownst to her, we too unleashed our glory because of her. We were unapologetic in claiming our glory. Dr. McKittrick not only serves as a role model, she's an excellent teacher and mentor. In the classroom, she creates space for difficult conversations and pushes her students to move beyond what we know, to move beyond what has been given to us. As a mentor, she is incredibly supportive of students and faculty, particularly people of color. As a case in point, in October 2016, she was named the inaugural recipient of the Ben Ree Foundation Mentorship Award for a continued mentorship of students at Queen's and across Canada. I know I am standing here today because Dr. McKittrick saw me. She made me feel visible. Because of her guidance and unpaid labor, Long after I left her classroom, she still took the time to mentor me. As most of you are aware, Dr. McKittrick's scholarship needs no introduction. Her work is interdisciplinary and attends to the links between theories of liberation, black studies, cultural production, and geographic thought. Her research program also attends to the writings of Jamaican intellectual Sylvia Winter. In addition to demonic grounds, Dr. McKittrick has edited and contributed to both Sylvia Winter on being human as praxis and black geographies and the politics of place. Her next monograph, Dear Science and Other Stories, is an exploration of black mythologies, methodologies. It is in production with Duke University Press. She is currently working on two projects. The first, unnamed, attends to questions of extraction in relation to black studies the physical geographies of the Black Atlantic, and Black cultural production. The second, Pastel Blue, studies color, color theory, image making, and Black creative text. Dr. McKittrick is in the midst of finalizing almost seven years as editor at Antipode, a radical journal of geography, and with Simone Brown and Deb Cohen, she co-edits the Duke University Press book series, Aaron Trees. Dr. McKittrick is an outstanding scholar activist. Just this year, she was awarded the American Association of Geographers Harold M. Rose Award for Anti-Racism Research and Practice. The award honors geographers who have served to advance the discipline through their research and who've also had an impact on anti-racist practice. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear Dr. McKittrick speak today on Living Just Enough for the City, Volume 6, Black Methodologies. Can I get a what, what? <laughs> Without further ado, please join me in welcoming the phenomenal Dr. McKittrick. Thank you, Grace. I had a big part in uh, changing the title of International Women. <laughs> as did my colleague uh, at Queens at the time, Dean and Georgies. Um, and it's the rain. It was the rain when I was leaving. Other, you know, I had it. It was all cooked. It's ready to come out. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful, um, I, like I have a few tears in my eyes. Uh, Grace has joined us at Queens uh, as the new Queens National Scholar in 
in black geographies. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy she's back, and I'm happy she wanted to come back, um, because it's not an easy space to do black studies in, but, but we're getting there. Um, and I'm happy she's a part of that, that narrative that we're, that we're creating. Um, thank you, Leanne, so much. Um, I, know that, I know that you're the brains behind a lot of the infrastructure of this, and you're, I know how much work it is, so I appreciate all the work you're doing. And Linda Peak, thank you. I, I, don't, I don't quite know how to thank you, Linda. Um, I, there was a little, you know, a little Twitter conversation a few months ago, began by <laughs> Manel Mahanti, um, talking about what a great uh, professor you are, a great intellectual, a great mentor. Um, so if you follow me, you can, <laughs> um, you can check that out. But I, I, but I appreciate you so much. Um, you're, you're, you set the standard for how um, I engage with my students and engage with ideas. So I appreciate that. And as I, it's hard returning to New York. I, it's not my favorite uh, space on the planet. Um, and. Uh, I was talking to a, a friend and colleague, and we were talking about the, the persuasiveness of supervisors, and I didn't even question it. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> so um, I'm back here. Um, so, uh, I, so my talk um, today, so you see the scrolling uh, text, which includes the footnotes and bits and pieces of the talk that I'm going to share with you today. Um, and it's, I think, you know, I read it through, it's about 35 minutes, um, but I read it quite quickly last night for personal reasons. Um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't go too long so we can have a conversation about maybe how the talk speaks to the broader conversation that we had in the, in the panels and things like that. I hope, it, I hope it overlaps, but I also understand that it's going to um, diverge as well. So my presentation is divided into two parts. The first part, um, I have to take off my glasses, I can't, look, I can't admit bifocals yet. Um, in the first part I offer a confession and reflection. I show how these two narratives led to my ongoing preoccupation with methodology. The second section turns to alternative methodologies and what Black Studies has taught me about how we share and create ideas. So to the confession and reflection. The confession is that in my own work, I've had an unhappy relationship with the discipline of geography. When we work together, I am fraught and anxious and perpetually underread. I constantly worry about geography because it signals enclosure, material, theoretical, and analytical enclosure. And this is especially relevant to black and other marginalized communities. Geography is also a discipline that transforms itself according to theoretical and political change, yet never loses its colonial underpinnings. Of course, I'm not the first one to notice this. Geographers, especially feminist and anti-colonial geographers, have drawn attention to how the ownership of geographic knowledge proliferates to refuse, but not erase, alternative ways of being. Even still, the discipline and its practitioners seduce us with possibility. The everythingness of space and place is exciting. But as we dwell on and theorize and enjoy the everythingness, we suddenly realize that wonderful everythingness is so often imperialism in disguise. The reflection is a writing memory. About a decade ago, I wrote a paper on race, racism, and herbicide. As a way to help me write, I listened to Stevie Wonder's Living for the City and Marvin Gaye's Inner City Blues. I listened to these songs compulsively, and I realized that um, listening to them was the only way I could write the city. I asked uh, Dr. Mark Campbell to, to make me a mashup of the songs. Mark layered samples and sections from Wonder and Gaye atop each other. I also made a little film showing different cities across the globe in distress. Burning cities, bombed cities, terrified cities, cities underwater, destroyed cities, undone cities. The city names were not specified in the film. I relied on the images themselves to delineate the differences and the similarities between, cities in between the cities in distress. 
the idea was that the viewer could both collapse and differentiate, for example, the Watts riots, World War II area bombings, and sunk in New Orleans. The soundtrack to that film was Mark Campbell's mashup. The original paper was revised and reworked and rewritten and eventually became on plantations, prisons, and a black sense of place, which was published in Social and Cultural Geography in 2011. In addition to thinking about the possibilities and limits of herbicide, that piece also works with the writings of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, specifically her book, Golden Gulag, and the map from Golden Gulag by Craig Gilmore, which marks state adult prisons, acts as a visual centerpiece to the herbicide paper. The social and cultural geography paper is dedicated to Clyde Woods as a way to recognize his insistence that black creatives are central to theories of liberation. My confession and reflection together highlight some of the key ideas surrounding the production of space and how it relates to blackness, racial violence, and theorizing difference. The paper is nowhere and nothing without Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye. The paper could not have been written without Golden Gulag and the map. A black sense of place, one of the central concepts of that paper, could not emerge without the non-academic yet theoretically rigorous creative infrastructures produced by black people and Doreen Maxi. Um, <laughs> the geographic underpinnings of the paper are its anchors, cities in distress, prisons, the analytical habit of reducing black people and their geographies to objects. I argue that these black geographies enclose but also provide the conditions to theorize black life rather than dwelling on social and geographic death. The friendship of Clyde Woods found in the dedication is a reminder of beats, grooves, slides, and the political economy of the plantation blocks, but also the expansiveness of heartbreak. The confession and reflection asks that the urban, which for some of us in this room is code for black, be theorized as a site that is grounded in spatial infrastructures but cannot be contained by the analytical and geographic perimeters of the city is Stevie Wonder. Whenever I write, whenever I think about the production of space, I want to hold on to all of this, the racial violence, the cities in distress, the beats and grooves, the heartbreak, the songs and the prisons and the plantations, as a way to emphasize that the lesson is not to make and therefore stabilize space, but instead to continually theorize place as relation and recognize that the work of theorizing is in itself how black geographies are lived and expressed. This is for me what black cities make possible, urban worlds unhinged from the coloniality of place and comprised of secrets and narratives and stories and songs that are sites of learning. The urban, coded as black, is therefore a poetics of place. What I mean by this is that cities, for some of us, are utterances and sighs and intimate freedoms, thus delineating that the political work of the urban, for many marginalized communities, is less about location and more about ways of living and expressing and looking for liberation. The hope is to, the hope is to notice the materiality of geography while also reaching for alternative spatial practices that are obscured by prevailing geographic knowledges. How do we do this? I went to my bookshelves and I looked up for my geography books. Now this is my home book. This is my home bookshelves, not my office ones, because I think that would be very different. Anyway, so what I found uh, on my home bookshelves was a social geography of the city, America's Johannesburg, cities of difference, cities of the dead, city of courts, dead cities, real cities. I am reminded that I am hopelessly underread and that I have a lot of city books written by Mike Davis. <laughs> um, <laughs> I reviewed some journals, uh, and this is a, this was um, a method of researching that Linda Peak taught me uh, when we wrote a piece together, go to the stacks, go back the last 10 years of the journals that you that you read, go back the last 10 years and then start from the 10 years ago and then track the kind of ideas that you're thinking about in, say, about a dozen of those journals. It's very rigorous. Um, so I reviewed some journals, Antipode, uh, International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, Society and Space, and so on. Uh, in her article, 21st, The 21st Century Quest for Feminism, 
and the global urban. Linda Peek outlines the key debates animating urban studies and urban feminist studies. Her discussion of north-south, productive, unproductive, the planetary urban and, the plan and planetary urbanization reveals the analytical limits of urban reveals that the ana, reveals that the analytical limits of urban studies are tied to gender. This includes the absenting of women and women of color from analyses, the crude categorization of these women and their experiences, the positioning of overdeveloped regions as modern, the construction of the global south as underdeveloped and outside modernity, the inability to grasp how women from non-western or non-northern cities are adjective, geographic, feminist, activist. Her article allows us to see very clearly how race and gender and capital shape the kinds of theoretical questions we ask, and how urban futures might be different, differently imagined through methodology. She ends by bringing together some key theorists and her own observations to argue that how we gather and put together knowledge about our research sites and their inhabitants must be dialogical, provisional, open-ended, generative, border-crossing, traveling, revisable. I kept reading and I was reminded of some other works that focus on black cities. Zenzali Asoki's work on hip hop and the making of urban space in, in Newark, Marlon Bailey's geographies of black drag communities in Detroit, Chocolate Cities, and Catching Hell in the, cities of, in the City of Angels. These kinds of texts show that unforgiving urban economies provide the conditions for alternative modes of care, creativity, and community. Importantly, the black city is not simply a site of oppression that is resisted, thus keeping in place existing spatial processes. The black city is also a site where black humanity is reinvented outside the logics of racism. Mark Campbell's amazingly smart work on Toronto and other Canadian hip-hop cities includes exhibits, DJ remixes, vinyl and cassette archives, documenting graffiti and other creative acts. His curation and research document not just where black geographies are and who resides within them, but the active remaking of urban in infrastructures through co-authorship and relationality across racial identifications. The city, coded as black, is not a site of authenticity, but instead a location of creative negotiation and conversation and imagination. At the end of her paper on Afropolitanism, Grace Ogunyakin puts an analytical wager on black women's imagination. Ogunyakin demonstrates how neoliberal urbanization in Ibadan, Nigeria, is undercut by Nigerians' women's affective and embodied resistance. She reminds us that the imagination is necessary to and anticipates political action. Ogunyakin's work, like many black studies texts, centers how crucial the imagination is to the production of black geographies. Indeed, to put a wager on the imagination as a subversive and meaningful anticipatory and anticipatory politic is reminiscent of Toni Morrison's important insight that, quote, only the active imagination can help me, or Nerbezi Phillips' brilliant work on image, which, she writes, is a voice of silence that acknowledges but cannot fully encapsulate the brutality of enslavement and the living memory of slavery. The imagination offer, offers a future that is not absolute knowing. The imagination as a political enunciation honors the intellectual work of conceptualization without requiring full disclosure of what we are imagining. Put differently, the imagination dreams, but the dream does not have to be fully told or extracted from us. It is the work of dreaming that saves some of us. When the dream occasionally unravels into a material place, we rejoice while also recognizing that most of the dream was not captured by placemaking. To borrow from Elizabeth Alexander, part of the work of black studies and therefore a black sense of place is to imagine a radical future outside the parameters of how we, black people, are seen in this culture. The black interior, conceptualization and imagination are meaningful because we know that the tendency reiterated by research outcomes and learning outcomes, so the tendency is to meticulously track and is to meticulously tra track and describe oppression and pinpoint and totally know uh, practices of resistance as well. Because some scholar scholarly work demands uh, because some scholarly work demands that results be expressed 
in colonial time and space, the unidentifiable is often cast aside. For, for, for me and for in black studies, the unidentifiable is the imagination. It's also embodiment, it's affect, it's experience, it's relation, and more. As I've argued elsewhere, the academic move to, to, the academic move to study as a way to totally know and, and have blackness requires proving and describing black people as unknowing, unimaginable, and unimagining thus exposing the fullness of objectification and the depoliticization of our black worlds. There are some days when the imagination is all I have. There are some cities we imagine differently than you. I live in a city that cannot exist without black imagination. Meticulously tracking, pinpointing, and describing racism and other forms of oppression is tied to unfreedom. Imagination and conceptualization unravel to highlight the significance of creative and collaborative interdisciplinary labor. The combination of conceptualization, imagination, and collaboration and creative output is the fulcrum of what I call Black Atlantic livingness, or what Sylvia Winter calls being human as praxis. Many Black scholars and creative Creatives provide useful strategies to complement and problematize the question of the urban because they enact what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls abolition geographies. What Gilmore so brilliantly offers are place-making activities that are not territory-based or land-specific, but instead invested in free freedom, consciousness, and capacity. The activities are existing, provisional, and still to come. The activities are collaborative and creative life ways. With this analytical move, Gilmore allows us to imagine the production of space, the city, the urban, elsewhere, um, as tied to the practice of liberation because the work of making place, what she calls abolition geography, I'm quoting from her now, takes feeling and agency to be constitutive of, no less constrained by structure. In other words, this is still her, her, a quote from her, in other words, it's a way of studying and doing political organizing and of being in the world, and of worlding ourselves. Feeling, agency, studying, doing, organizing, being, worlding. Or geography is no longer relegated to the study of land, people, and infrastructures only, uh, and physiography only, but it is yoked to practices of liberation. Or geography as we know it is realized and lived as a series of verbs and collaborations. Gilmore thus affirms what I've been arguing for several years. Black geography and black geographies are theorized as verbs by a range of black and anti-colonial scholars. And this undoes a priori the terribleness of enclosure that so often animates prevailing geographic knowledges. This puts what I have called the black ungeographic and a black sense of place to work in productive ways because it casts placemaking as a set of ideas and rebellions rather than a knowable geography. As verbs, black geographies are shared as curiosities and st strategies without, as Toni Morrison wrote, the mandate for conquest. The idea of where becomes something else altogether. It becomes a praxis that is invested in liberation. So what might this look like again? I think it means that we take all we have, all the music, all the books, all the heartbreak and the infrastructure, and imagine the production of space to be the incomplete and unending gathering of ideas and creative, and creative and collaborative labor. I think it means reading widely and teaching each other how to read differently and sharing what has helped us struggle against oppression. It also means being okay with opacity. I think it also speaks to Peake's call to reorient, reorient our methodological approach because we cannot delink the production of knowledge from the production of space. When I completed Demonic Grounds, I became increasingly interested in methodology. Um, it, has, it has, in fact, been a constant preoccupation, um, almost an obsession, because I began to notice that the world of academic methodologies kept denying, erasing, or obscuring the ideas of black folks. <laughs> This is not, I want to be really clear at this moment, a plea to cite black women or a plea not to cite white men. Um, this is a conversation about methodology and how methodology can shape the outcome of our research projects, regardless of who we cite. 
Part of the, the trouble is that when researching black and other vulnerable communities, we have been taught to use methodologies that are designed to prove oppression and racial violence. My concern became more and more intense as I noticed that the method, whether this be data collection, surveys, discourse analysis, participant observation, ethnography, theorization, or whatever, the method understood in advance that black people and black communities were less than human. The method, I came to realize, was already invested in black social death. The methodology, the procedure of collecting, assembling, and evaluating, sought to study and assess, and sometimes fix and save and recuperate, um, a genre of blackness that was less than human. This means, of course, that the method cannot in any way imagine or illuminate black life, black livingness, or a black sense of place. This means that black non-humanity is a scholarly requirement. The methodology, the act of collecting data that leads to research and learning outcomes, is a discursive colonial tool that already knows and therefore reproduces how things already are. The methodology, the act of collecting data that leads to re research and learning outcomes, is a discursive tool that already knows and therefore reproduces the, the idea that black people are dehumanized. This kind of, it is this kind of analytical move that I cannot get out of my head. The question of black humanity either does not enter the equation or is the object of a reparative project that seeks to elevate black people to the status of what Audre Lorde calls the mythical norm. And for those people who've heard me talk, give different talks about black methodology, this is what Fanon is talking about in Wretched of the Earth. Like the desire to become, like the, the, require, the colonial requirement is that the black become more colonial and therefore invest in the anti-blackness, right? So, so anyway, it's a, it's, or the object of a reparative project that seeks to elevate black people to the status of what Audre Lorde calls the mythical norm. Not dislodging how things are, but venerating racial capitalism and its straight and white and patriarchal expressions. In order to unthink how things already are, I have turned to studying methodology and tracking and reimagining methodological habits. I've turned primarily to methodologies in black and anti-colonial studies as a model because these fields of study have offered a sustained engagement with multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. I've noticed that many black and anti-colonial scholars are rigorous, which means that they do not just throw ideas together or put ideas together, but that they read widely and deeply and think relationally. This not only challenges disciplinary silos that animate our academic and extra-academic worlds, it centralizes the intellectual complexity that undergirds black ways of knowing and the difficult work of liberation. I argue, too, that most black, black people live radical or rogue, as Lisa Lowe suggested I use, radical or rogue interdisciplinary lives. And this means that methodology is not only a process of gathering information, but a way of being. Some of my work is focused on, and some of my tasks and goals and ideas are, and I'm always open for revision, um, conceptualizing theory as a creative narrative, noticing the creative potential of theory, always insisting that black creative texts are, theoreti oh, black creative texts, are theoretical texts. The creative is re relational to theory. The creative is relational to theory, but not the object of theoretical inquiry. Recognizing how and when and where creative texts provide theoretical insights. Not over-celebrating theory as poetic or creative. Not over-celebrating the creative as theoretical. Hearing mu music as the production of space, loving music, love music. Finding Norbezi Philip in Toronto. Norbezi Philip is Toronto. Remember to call Norbezi Philip. <laughs> That's serious. Theorizing all creative acts as heretical to the all theorizing all creative acts as heretical to the academic form and disciplinarity. Showing that disciplinary thinking inside and outside the academy is empire. Knowing and demanding and sharing and believing that description is not liberation. Reading and rereading the poetics of relation, reading and rereading the intimacies of four continents, reading and rereading the Black Atlantic. Sylvie Winter, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Nina Simone, Richard Aiton, Franz Fanon. Embracing diasporic literacy, 
reading outside black studies, reading non-academic texts, reading books I do not like but are informative, don't be afraid of heartbreak, study the plantation, study the plantation as a city, study the plantation, do not fetishize the plantation, remember that plantation futures are extensions of but do not replicate the plantation, trust the black imagination, put an analytical wager on the black imagination, reading and rereading, insert everything you have time to read that help you think about this topic. Positing that the method of interdisciplinarity is rogue or radical, and therefore the process of gathering and sharing knowledge that works toward liberation. Rogue interdisciplinarity is not a calculus. Rogue interdisciplinarity is not a template or a predictive. And meshing different ideas from different sources to reinvent idea making that exceeds normative ways of knowing. Revising the academic form, cherishing the academic form, read and reread and support black scholars, especially junior black scholars, cite junior black scholars, keep it up, don't wear down ever. The story and storytelling or methodology do not fetishize the plantation. Sustaining curiosity rather than knowability, sustaining wonder, speculating that Stevie Wonder is the only city I know, noticing that June Jordan gave me a new city, reading Dion Brand's inventory as purposeful urban study, sharing ideas, developing and holding on to with all your heart radical friendships. So with these tasks in mind, I'm going to close with a brief uh, summary of how this comes together in my most recent book, which is in production, if you didn't see it up there. Um, finally, um, how this comes together in my most recent book. And I will veer outside the geographic disciplinary parameters of the conference, but I hope this proves to be a useful model, at least momentarily, for a version of method making that is curious and capacious rather than colonizing. So in my research and writing, I share, a, and in Dear Science, I share a series of interdisciplinary stories that are indebted to anti-colonial thought and black studies. Part of my argument, as I've already noted, is that black people have always used interdisciplinary methodologies to explain, explore, and story the world, because thinking and writing and imagining across a range of texts, disciplines, histories, and genres unsettles suffocating and dismal and insular racial logics. By employing interdisciplinary methodologies and living interdisciplinary worlds, black people bring together various sources and texts and narratives to challenge and undo racism. Or black people bring together various sources and texts and narratives not to capture something or someone, but to question the analytical work of and the desire to capture something or someone. Within black studies and anti-colonial studies, one can observe the ongoing method of gathering multifariously textured tales, narratives, fictions, whispers, songs, grooves. What is meaningful are the ways in which black people are interdisciplinary actors, continually entangling and disentangling the very, very disentangling varying narratives, tempos, hues that together invent and reinvent knowledge. The work is rigorous. The practice of bringing together multiple texts, stories, songs, and places involves the difficult work of thinking and learning across many sites, and thus coming to know generously varying and shifting worlds and ideas. Sometimes this is awful because we are gathering dense texts and uncomfortable ideas that wear us out. Sometimes this is awful because we are aware that we cannot know forever, and yet we are committed to the everlasting effort to figuring out how we might together across racial identifications fashion liberation. And we also have no time. This rigor is animated by diasporic literacy, Vivek Clark's wonderfully useful reading practice that investigates and shows how we already do or can illuminate and connect existing emerging diasporic codes and tempos and stories and narratives and themes. Clark shows that diasporic literacy is structured through recognized, re recognized references sharing a wealth of connotations. She theorizes Caribbean feminism and literatures and Malhaya Jackson and Cal Kenyan politics, food, furnishings, and laughter as grammars 
figures and practices that are written into creative and intellectual texts as prompts, as prompts. These prompts and literacies function to expand the text inside itself. Mahaya Jackson and laughter are not endlessly explained by her, and they're not endlessly unpacked over and over and over, but instead cue what does not need explanation, but requires imagination and memory and study. Like sorrow songs, like freedom dreams, like erotic, like flying cheekbones. For this reason, I've turned to thinking about how methodology is tied to stories and storytelling. Telling, sharing, listening to, and hearing stories are relational and interdisciplinary and imaginative acts that are animated by all sorts of people, places, and narrative devices, and theor theoretical queries, plots, and so on. The process of storytelling is sustained by invention and wonder. The story has no answers. The story offers an aesthetic relationality that relies on the dynamics of creating, narrating, listening, hearing, reading, and sometimes unhearing. The story signal, the stories signal ways of living in a world that denies black humanity. The story text itself, read aloud or quietly, is an imprint of black life and livingness that tells of the wreckage and the lists and the dance floors, and the loss, and the love, and the rumors, and the lessons, and the heartbreak. The story asks that we live with what cannot be explained, and live with unexplained cues and diasporic literacies, rather than reams and reams and reams of positivist evidence. The story opens the door to curiosity. The reams of evidence dissipate as we tell the world differently, with a creative precision, the story asks that we live with the difficult and frustrating ways of knowing differentially. And some things we can keep to ourselves. They cannot have everything. Stop her autopsy. They cannot have everything. We don't have to give them everything they want to hear. I focus on stories and storytelling as a way to hold on to the methodological work of sharing ideas in an unkind world. Sharing is not understood as an act of disclosure, but instead signals collaboration and collaborative ways to enact and engender struggle. Stories and storytelling signal, also signal the fictive work of theory. I hope this move, at least momentarily, exposes the intricacies of academic work where fact-finding, fact experimentation, analysis, and study are recognized actually as what they are, which is a narrative, a plot, a tale, and incomplete inventions, rather than impartial practices and methods. As story, theory is cast as fictive knowledge and insists that the black imagination is necessary to analytical curiosity and study. Story is theoretical, story is dance, poem, song, geography, affect, photograph, painting, sculpture, and more. Maybe the story is one way to express and fall in love with black life. Maybe the story disguises our fall. The story, too, Dina Georgis writes, has the capacity to effectively move us and at the same time incite a listening practice that is neither disengaged nor wanting to master what it sees and hears. If the function of the story is to invite the reader, viewer, interlocutor, listener, to feel, respond, and be moved. It is also, Ruth Wilson Gilmore reminds us, it also, Ruth Wilson Gilmore reminds us, establishes powerful alignments, provisional and not, that are put to work with and for loved ones. Gilmore shows how utilizing various narrative devices and reading across materials, photocopies, pamphlets, newsletters, scripture, drawings, announcements, legal documents, and cases and theories. So reading across various materials engenders practices of solidarity and collaboration that work within existing and imagine new geographies of liberation. The story as interdisciplinary method is thus tasked with immense and hopeful possibilities. The story for me is the practice of black life with and for love. In this way, and as an interdisciplinary methodology, the story, theoretical, creative, groovy, skilled, action-based, secret, shared, the story is a verb activity that invites engagement, 
curiosity, wonder, and collaboration. The task is, I believe, to get in touch with the materiality of our analytical worlds, to draw attention to how Black Studies thinks across a range of places, times, genres, texts, hues, grooves that are punctuated with diasporic literacy, and collectively think, know, live Black life as curious, studied, and grounded. The analytics as story allows us to learn and share and get in touch without knowing totally. Thus, as we grieve long-standing racial violences, as we are punished by memories of those we have lost, as we archive the most brutal, brutal of punishments, as we are weighed down by losing her or them or he over and over and we know her and we do not know them and we know her and we know their name but we didn't know their name until it happened. We, know, we did not know his name until he was gone. I did not know his name, I cannot know, I found the name. I came across her after she was gone. I only know, knew after she was gone. So as we do all that and we feel the heartbreak and we see it again and again and again, and the loss is right there, right beside us, and as we grieve and collapse, we do not know absolutely. We must tell and live and generate an ethical difference. I hope to write and share and imagine an ethical distance while recognizing our collective histories of racial violence, how our collective histories of racial violence put pressure on how we live now. I found her picture. I hope to write an ethical dif distance and grieve what I, what we cannot totally know without the industry of objecthood enveloping her. I promise to keep your secret. Thank you.